Hi, everyone. Welcome again to another episode of Avanti Insights. I'm Adrian Vernon. Hey, today is an exciting and a different kind of episode here on Avanti Insights because I'm not only joined by one of our regular podcasters, that's Mr. Chris Gettle. Chris, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Adrian. All right. But, but Chris, we also have another Chris in the studio. We have a special guest stepping outside of Avanti, Chris Dancy. Uh, we look forward to unpacking this with you. Now, Mr. Gettle, I'm going to call you Mr. Gettle so we don't get the Chris's mixed up. So, Mr. Gettle, Chris Dancy is known as the world's most connected human. He's made appearances on the BBC, Wall Street Journal, Showtime. There have been TED Talks where he has been the subject of TED Talks. That's when you know that you've made it. And he's been on a host of other media outlets. He's a no keynote speaker and he's the author of Don't Unplug How Technology Saved My Life and Can Save Yours Too. And we're going to dive into that and unpack that. So, so Mr. Gettle, you ready to dive in with Chris Dancy, the most connected human in the world? Yeah, no, this is uh, definitely going to be an exciting topic. I think what he's gone through and the different ways that technology are impacting our lives is something that I don't think we stop and think about enough. And getting his perspective on this, I think, is going to be really eye-opening for a lot of people. Yeah, I agree. I think the time is just going to fly by. So, Chris Dancy, we really appreciate you coming on. I want to start with this title, this moniker you have, the world's most connected human. I've also seen the most connected man on earth. It makes me think of that Dos Equis beer campaign not too long ago about the most interesting man in the world. And I'm sure that you've, you've probably heard that. But tell us, this moniker, is this self-proclaimed or, or is this bestowed on you by some media outlet? How did it come about? Like all Silicon Valley lore, there's a little story. <laughs> So I think it was 2012. I was scheduled to be on Bloomberg has a tech news show out of the Bay Area. They, they record on the wharf and a guy named Corey, who's the host at that time, who's moved on. I think he's at NBC or something, interviewed me and they filmed me walk around the city and they were like, taking pictures of my sensors and all this other kind of stuff. And during the segment, he said, Chris Dancy, probably the world's most surveilled man. It's okay. You know, whatever. It's a little, little, little little exciting little little titillation there right i i didn't like it the, the whole idea of surveillance but you know it's okay month or two months later i was being interviewed by bbc and they had i guess seen that and then they broadcasters said chris tancy you're probably the world's most connected person and he was i think he was picking up the other one and then that slowly morphed you know most connected person most connected man and then between 2013 and now here we are in 2021 or depending on when you're listening to this show 2022 or the future it's it's literally just become bigger and bigger and bigger my my favorite fact is you can just take two words most connected you don't have to do man or person or any you just take most connected and it comes up in every country in google regardless of language and let's clarify that when you say most connected, it's not about you having the most connections on LinkedIn and being a Kevin Bacon's six degrees of separation type. It's really about connected through technology. Correct. So think of nodes on a network. If you, you know, most of your listeners are IT folks, think of you know, connections or configurations uh, from an asset management or an ERD or any of the other things we do. All I did was take kind of my early maybe affliction, I would call it, with service management and IT systems starting back in the late 70s. And then in mapping my life, I made these connections visible and people thought that was interesting. And then they go, oh my gosh, look how connected you are. And I didn't tell them that they're actually just as connected. <laughs> now, I've seen a stat that says you've, you're, con you're connected via something like 700 devices. Is that is, is that number still accurate? Has it gone up since that was last published? And you're saying that people are actually have a lot more connected devices than they even imagine. And maybe they're even closer to that 700 than they thought. I'd say in 2021, most people are probably anywhere between five and 10,000 connections simultaneously throughout the day, the average person. They just don't think about them through the lens that you normally would if you were thinking about managing a network. Because, you know, we're used to like, well, you're connected to what you can see, but that's just not true when everything's in the cloud, right? So I always like to, to, to tell people, okay, let's just walk back kind of the old 
the old quote that magazines use: seven hundred devices, sensors, applications, and services. There's four, right? This is four things, right? Back in like tw- ten years ago, devices and sensors. Well, you can have a device like a phone, and that phone can have multiple sensors in it. Right away, a device with multiple sensors creates multiple configurations. So the ambient light sensor plus the device is one configuration. The ambient device sensor plus the sound microphone is another configuration. Light plus sound becomes a third configuration. This is making sense. I want to go real slow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right. So then, so that's devices and sensors. Now you've got applications and services. So let's talk about applications. You know, you've got your Avanti app or your, you know, whatever app you're using to manage your systems. You've got your information security app. Well, then that probably is backed up by some cloud systems. Maybe it's an Amazon cloud system. Maybe it's a, it's a security management system that actually manages the authentication. All right. What most people don't see when they look at their life, you know, starting out at, you remember the old t- fiber, fiber optic from, from MCI back in the 1990s, you know, like you just from one point to another. What most people don't see is from one point to another, you're going through a lot of pipes. You know, they used to call the internet of pipes. I was just one of those people who, as carefully as I could because of my background in service management and IT to say, well, what are those pipes? Where am I stored? And how do I extract myself out? Uh, so Mr. Gettle, I'm gonna, and I, I, we don't like the formality here on Avanti Insights, but we're you just, just trying say Chris, to. You can call him Chris too. Just say his Chris okay. faster. All right, you, you <laughs> think you think we can get away with that? Maybe we can. All right, so, uh, so, so Chris, being on the security side, when you hear about you know Chris Dancy being connected in this way, what alarm bells does that ring for you, if any, from a security standpoint? Thinking about it from a, from a, a, a corporate enterprise perspective. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, the, Chris, this was one of the parts that I was really looking forward to talking to you about and getting your perspective is over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, there's been some just tremendous evolutions in how connected we are, where our personal data is. I, I mean, it, it's surprising it took us as long as it has to really get to these more serious privacy um, and regulatory policies, things like the California Privacy Act, the GDPR, other things like that. It, it, I guess to start with, what has surprised you? What what surprised you early on as you dug in deeper into all of these things and found out how much of your information, how much of your personal life was really out there? And today, what is still surprising you? And that, that might even be like people not fully understanding how connected they are. As, as you've already pointed out, I think most people really don't understand that. I'll, I'll throw kind of a personal story out there. When it comes to social social media, kids have no understanding of that, and their parents probably even less. Different social apps that have touted the fact that, oh, yeah, you can do anything on here, and then suddenly it's gone. It's, yeah, you snap this, and then it's gone. You, you know, uh, Well, those things don't necessarily go away, and I think yeah. that's a, a huge misunderstanding. So yeah. I, I guess I've asked a couple of questions in there, starting with the what surprised you back in the day and what continues to surprise you, and then the the perspective of others and how how their understanding really fits into it. You know, I think the biggest thing back in the day is if you go back to 2007 when I was using Yahoo Pipes to dig myself out of the internet, right, was just how much fragmentation there is in identity, right? Uh, like, it, it's so much, it's so easy if you're managing a server farm with a bunch of applications on it and those application stacks roll up to different, I mean, that's, let's be honest, that's where you can leave, people diagram that for a living, right? But when you think about your life, it's just like, oh my goodness, if I'm on MySpace and I write something, where is it going? Who's seeing it? And like, how do I, how do I have a record of it, right? You have to go to MySpace to get a record. So I think the first thing early on that blew my mind was just how absolutely untenable it is to try to understand and extract yourself from the internet. It's almost like tentacles. So that involved me kind of building a lot of systems and, and, and infrastructure. And I'll be honest with you, just wrote uh, nomenclature for how to understand these systems. You know, are they biological systems, are they behavioral systems, are they environmental systems? You know, where in the stack are they? Is it, you know, is the data, is it a time stack layer? Is it a, is it an activity stack layer? Is it, is it a location stack, right? Is it, is, is it an environment? You know, there's, it's, there's so much to it. I think today, if I'm being honest and a little provocative, the thing that makes me most kind of mind blown about folks today is they 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 seem to care about privacy when it's convenient, but when they need something, it goes out the window, right? So they will you know easily hand over their phone number and everything else to get ten cents off a, a bag of chips, but like they're worried that Mark Zuckerberg's gonna like knock at the front door asking for their firstborn child, and I just think you can't have those two things in the same life. 
right? You have to see all of your information through the same lens. And to me, that lens isn't privacy, it's safety, right? And we have to stop negotiating with ourselves and our family's safety under this illusion that somehow we're more powerful for it. If you want to be powerful, ask Sam's Club for your purchase history. Find out why you gained weight the last 10 years. Don't worry about what they're doing with it, right? There's a level of autonomy that's missing in the privacy debate. And I think what you, last thing you said about, you know, kind of moving forward is I, we really need to sit down and talk to our kids because the jobs in the next 10, 20 years, like I'm 53 years old now. I started my first computer in the late 1970s as, an, as a 10 year old, right? You've got a kid who's 10. You should be teaching them about the data that makes up their lives, not about the ser service issue. There'll be a hundred Facebooks. There'll be a, something after the iPhone and the iPhone, but we need to have these talks with our family. Now, Chris, we mentioned earlier that you have authored a book a couple years ago, Don't Unplug, How Technology Saved My Life and Can Save Yours Too. How did technology save your life? Give us that background. Oh, my goodness. You know, like, like a lot of people, especially today, I was, I was you know, okay, doing well. If you're in tech, you're kind of doing well. You might jump from job to job, but I was doing well. But I was having a lot of uh, emotional uh, and physical and, and biological problems. I'll be honest with you. I, there wasn't a job I had between the 1990s when I started a gold mine, which became heat, which, you know, which became, you know, la I've then Landesk and then, you know, then, then ServiceNow and then BMC and, you know, it's just any of these jobs. There wasn't a job I had where I wasn't successful at what I was doing, but my body looked otherwise. So I was, you know, 320 pounds at that point. I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. If a salesperson needed something, I had to jump on a demo. I would do that. If a consultant needed me to jump, pitch in and do that, I was always on a plane. I was constantly angry at everything. I mean, I put on a good, good act, right? You know, you do, you're paid well to behave, but at the end of the day, no one was managing the IT of me, a human piece of a capital. I think they call it human capital now is what Amazon calls us or calls humans. And I, ju I just thought to myself, I'm going to die. I was 40 years old and I was on all sorts of medicines and I, I, this is not going to last, you know. And then I started looking at my life, like we said earlier, and actually creating routines to like if I put something on the Internet or touched a piece of technician tech, it grabbed the data from that and threw it on my Google Calendar. It's that simple. Like where most people use calendars for appointments, I use a calendar for data storage. But what I did was I created different calendars within Google Calendar, one for health, like physical health, one for environment, one for like so socializing. And these calendars filled up with that data. And what I started doing was color coding data so that if it was the kind of behavior I wanted, it was one color, it was not. Like email will kill you, especially the email that comes in before you wake up. But no one really measures that. Right. We, we, we measure the security of email, but not how it's affecting the people. Right. I, I always believe that human resources and IT really need to merge in the future. Right. Because we're treating people like IT and we're treating human. You know, what I mean, there's, there's a lot there to unpack. So, you know, when I say the technology saved my life, I mean, it absolutely did. I would not be here today had I not done what I did and not got in touch with myself. Does it continue to save my life? You know, there are days like everyone else where it's really stressful, even for me who manages it all really well. But at the end of the day, understanding who you are and what you value changes the way you use your technology. And if you can use your technology to express your values, whether it's a hashtag for something provocative or donating to a cause you really like, that's the human capital we should be focusing on. Okay. Don't unplug how technology saved my life. It can save yours too. Now I have to admit, Chris, you know, when I when I first thought about that and don't unplug, because there are times where I think, God, I just need a break, man. I, I, I need to unplug. And there's a book that I read a number of years ago. It came out about 10 years ago. It's called The Winter of Our Disconnect. I don't know if you've heard of this book. And the subtitle is How Three Totally Wired Teenagers and a Mother Who Slept With Her iPhone Pulled the Plug on Their Technology and Lived to Tell the Tale and took place in, in they were lived in New York City. And it was about a six month period where they were just totally disconnected and just to you know, kind of recharge and refresh. And of course, the winner of our disconnect, that's Mr. Gettle. 
you must know if you I don't know if you're a novel historian, but John Steinbeck in 1961 wrote a famous novel called The Winter of Our Discontent, and it actually helped him win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1962. So there's a little literature history. So that's that book is kind of playing on that. And so I guess, Chris, what would you say to someone who says, God, I need a break. I need to unplug. I must unplug. What would you say in that case? Listen, this book was written in 2017. I've been living that life at that point for at least eight years. You know, if someone said to me today, I need to unplug, I, I don't think I'd say don't, like today in 2021. I, you know, this the book was actually not called Don't Unplug. It, it was changed at, like in the last week before it actually went to print. The book was called I Am You Tomorrow, which was really a little, 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 little interesting tidbit nowadays. We'll see how that works out. You know, again, I'm not going to tell people how to live their life. If you need to unplug, unplug. My problem with unplugging, my problem with, you know, these digital Sabbaths, my problem with, you know, the social dilemma and all of these other things is really simple. We cannot spend a decade telling people technology is breaking them and then lock them in a house where all they can use is technology. Yeah, and I, I think that's an interesting point. So, I, Chris, I live up in Minnesota, and, and uh. you know we have some long and hard winters. You know, so one thing that there's there's a couple of things that I do that absolutely are technology, but they're the ways that I do unplug yeah. from the the stresses of technology to embrace something I enjoy, but still involves technology. So I do a lot of reading, writing, blogging. I mean, I don't, I can't tell you how many emails I read a day articles that I have to research or things like that, writing blog posts, things like that. I mean, I, I hassle my kids to go and, you know, unplug and read a book every once in a while. Yet when I go and unplug from work, I usually go and listen to an audiobook. Yeah. And my wife and my kids are like, oh, well, you know, that doesn't count. I'm like, well, doesn't it though? I'm reading and writing all day long. This is just listening to somebody else read to me. One of the best things you can do for your kids at a young age is read to them. Yeah. Because they're still getting a lot of that value. So I think I really like, you know, Chris, how you kind of describe the, it, it's the value of what you're doing. Yes. It, yes. It's yes. the other thing that I've done that I, I uh, did with this, especially this last winter is I'm using VR goggles to do workouts. I read a couple of blog posts from somebody who basically created a total workout, total body workout mm -hmm. around his VR goggles. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have things like, you know, Beat Saber and, you know, like a boxing so app. And you, oh, you know, it's a great, yeah, yeah. it's a great one. Gets your really yeah. good workout. So a variety of different apps like that, that all the apps that I've gotten on my Oculus are all workout related. It's just yeah. good activity, but it doesn't, using technology doesn't necessarily mean it's unhealthy. It's, it really is in how you use it. And I really like that aspect of, you know, what you're doing in your own life is looking at how you're using technology and how to use it for the, you know, the values you care about and in good, good, healthy ways. Yeah, and we're in a renaissance right now for that. I mean, you can see it everywhere. You can start to feel it. And, and again, I, I'm not, it used to make me really angry and it kind of still does if I'm being honest, this whole, you know, unplug because, you know, being the world's most connected man, that's like a slap in the face, right? But I think, if we could just come to terms with, well, what is it that you don't like? Let, let me give you a couple, two scenarios, I think, that are really just so provocatively compelling when you, when you work through them in your mind. You know, when I first met my husband five years ago, he used to always send me selfies. Now, listen, I'm dating. You already know you're attractive, right? I, I don't need reminders every day. And for the first month or so, I thought, well, this is kind of vain, Right? This is, I'm not sure if this is going to work out. This is not the type of person I want to date, you know, because I'm aging now. So I certainly don't want to take selfies every day. It's just a reminder. It's like, you know, Dorian Gray is locked in my phone. But that was for your literary, literary reference, Adrian. <laughs> but, but at dinner one night, he said to me, how come you never send me back photos? I'm like, you know, it's just not my thing, Fernando. I'm just not, I'm not really into, you know, the whole selfie thing. Yeah, I used to take a lot of them. But, you know, it's just, it feels kind of cringy to me now. And and he goes, I work so hard on them. And I'm like, you literally, it's a front facing camera. It's not a lot of work. And he goes, no, sometimes it'll take me three minutes to get it just right. And I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, look, and he hands me, or he hands me his phone. He says, you know, look, look at, and I see hundreds of like the similar photo before I see the one that he sent me. He was actually taking time because live photos were brand new to embed messages and phrases after the keyframe 
telling me how much he cared for me. And I thought it was just a selfie. I wasn't pressing on the photo to see if there was something after. Do you understand what I'm saying? And in that moment, I realized, man, am I just a selfish, self-centered person? I didn't realize that love was actually faster than narcissism. All right. And in and, and that way, it freed me because I thought to myself, I have to stop looking at what everyone else is doing as if it's some type of narcissistic, selfish pursuit. Because here was someone I cared for who was spending a lot of time who'd sent me a month worth of really nice messages, sometimes blow a kiss, sometimes mouth things to the camera. Because in live photos, you can put things in there. I had no idea. So that, that was kind of a big deal. And, and then the, the, the second thing was, you know, today with, with COVID and stuff, so many of us only have a choice to see people through cameras, right? So I just think it's it's really important we talk about kind of value tech. I, I can't I can't stress it enough because love is out there and we're doing a really hard job at finding it. Wow. You know what? So Mr. Gettle, not the typical <laughs> dialogue that we have on Avanti Insights, but I'm loving it. The time has flown by. Guys, we've just about reached our limit for this episode. So Chris, going uh, gonna to ask both Chris's, if you can stick around, I'd love to further our discussion, but we're going to break this into two parts. We're going to end episode seven here. We're going to flip over to episode eight, and we're going to ask people to kind of come in and make sure that they join us, you know, post episode seven for the continuation of this. We want to talk about a little more about security. We want to talk about the everywhere workplace and Avanti yes. right now. Chris is about empowering the everywhere workplace. And in a non-pandemic situation, you're traveling the world, you know, and working from everywhere. So we still have a lot more to unpack. We'd love it if you could stick around for a little while longer and join us on the I'm other side. so excited because I love getting techie. It's always weird when I slip into the <laughs> mindful cyborg away from most connected person. But yeah, it'll be fun. All right, all right folks, we're going to continue our conversation in episode eight with Chris Dancy, the most connected human in the world. So for now, till next time, stay safe, be secure, and keep smiling. <laughs>